and um, open the conference. Um, we are going to begin with the short clip from the film, and after that, I will be back on the platform to welcome you all again and to uh, invite the speakers to uh, come to the platform. So, could we begin with the film, please? And turn down the lights, I think. The suspense is killing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good. Been in a fire? Of a kind. Well, show your fingerprints, you know. I'm sorry about all that nonsense we've had to put you through. I imagine this is more awkward for you than it is for me. Well, hardly that, I suppose. Oh, I don't know. In spite of your political creed, it's you who are the gentleman. No titles nowadays, of course, but yours was a noble line. You are a prince of the church. And you to interrogate me. Well, times have changed. You were a hero to me in the resistance, you know, as you were to all of us. Tell me, do you ever miss those days? At least one was on the same side as all one's fellow countrymen. I make no distinction between my fellow men. Their service demands everything, and I warn you, permits everything. Is there any particular plot or counter-revolution you hope to unmask? Not unless you know of one. You believe it's harmless, yet require us discredited. And the point of arresting me? A cigarette. Oh, thank you. If I may smoke my own while they last. Oh, oh, come now. Drug cigarettes already. You see, you represent a religion which provides an organization outside the state. In your pulpit, you are more dangerous than a politician. With your war record, you're a national monument. You are outside the party, and that monument must be... Destroyed? Defaced. You see? I showed you my hand from the start. Do you want to see mine? I am difficult to trap and impossible to persuade. I am tenacious, wary, and proud. Could we turn up the lights? Thank you. Um, good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted again to welcome you to the Danube Institute Conference, Hammer, Sickle and Cross. Uh, it's on the relationship between religious freedom, government, secularism, and in the last century, 
their relationship with communism and with aggressive atheism. The film clip you have just seen was taken from one of two major films made about the case and the trial of Cardinal Mincenti. The other film was a 1950 Hollywood movie, Guilty of Treason, starring as the Cardinal, the eminent American actor, Charles Bickford, who was three times nominated for an Academy Award. It's a solid, well-made, historically accurate, and popular movie made very shortly after the events it's depicting, and it's written from a point of view you could describe, I think, as democratic, Christian, and to some extent American. Well worth seeing if you want to learn the basic truths of the Mincenti case. Now, the clip you have just seen was taken from a 1955 British film, The Prisoner, which starred the two celebrated British actors you just saw, um, uh, Sir Alec Guinness, of course, and Jack Hawkins. It's a, it's a film adopted, adapted from a play by Bridget Boland, an Irish writer living in London, about an unnamed Catholic cardinal who is interrogated and tortured by a clever communist apparatchik in order, as you have just heard, to discredit him and the church in the cause of building a better world without religious consolations. It has higher ambitions than the Hollywood film. It's open, therefore, to the criticism uh, leveled by the perceptive Canadian-Hungarian film critic, the late George Jonas, that in films of this kind, the fascist thugs are simply thugs but the communist thugs are figures of intriguing moral complexity. Perhaps for that reason, it makes a good introduction for today's conference, because we will be examining all the questions that begin to be raised in that clip. Um, at some future date, by the way, I think we hope to show the full movie and to hold a fill, an evening of discussion about it. But both films, precisely because they are different and aimed at somewhat different audiences, testify to the fact that the Mincenti trial and the similar trials of other churchmen in Central and Eastern Europe, which we'll also be looking at more closely later, were topics of great interest throughout the world, especially in Europe and North America. There was an almost universal interest then in the struggle between religion and communism in the 15 years after 1945. And there was also an appreciation that the outcome of that struggle was a vital one. It would decide whether man's mind would be a captive mind imprisoned by the government orthodoxies or, or a mind free to choose its own beliefs. In the end, history answered Stalin's question, how many divisions has the Pope when Mikhail Gorbachev introduced his wife Raisa in 1989 to Pope John Paul II with the words, my dear, may I introduce you to the foremost moral authority in the world. Since 1989, however, in an apparent atmosphere of greater freedom of conscience, the Christian churches have sometimes found that they are more confined and less influential in a post-Cold War climate of moral relativism that is itself suspicious of religious orthodoxy and sometimes seeks to expel it, from, often seeks to expel it from the public square. To that topic, we will obviously return in the second half of today's proceedings. All that may re remains now to me is to welcome you again, to thank our distinguished speakers, whom my colleague Ishvan Kish will introduce in a moment, um, to um, thank the other organizations uh, uh, which have helped with us, the, cult the Center for Cultural Renewal in Zagreb, um, the um, uh, American Embassy, um, uh, and um, I, I didn't have this written down and I knew I'd forget something. So, uh, and the Cardinal Vincenti Foundation. Um, I hope the fact that I've already spoken a lot about Cardinal Vincenti will make up for that lapse. My apologies. Um, uh, so let me therefore be, um, st stand aside and invite Ishvan uh, Kish to introduce the speakers and to moderate the first session, which is entitled simply Hammer, Sickle and Cross.
sorry, I'm just removing my mask. Um, well, thank you very much, John, for these kind words. Um, I would like to uh, also uh, broadly welcome everybody who could come here, uh, especially during the whole COVID uh, virus thing. I know it's much more difficult to go out <laughs> and attend events like this, so we're very happy that a lot of people could uh, attend. Also, it is uh, always a rare privilege uh, for me and I guess for the whole institution to be hosting uh, this very important event which is uh, generally about uh, Christian persecution under communism, but also to some extent uh, under today. And sadly, which this is still a very much neglected topic, uh, especially if you look at the crimes of communism, uh, these crimes are unfortunately still not really uh, spoken in the Western world. And this is especially true for the Christian persecution of communism. Uh, just under communism, uh, we had thousands of priests who have been killed tortured or thrown into prisons. Uh, the churches lost all their property, their schools, uh, all religious charities and civil society organizations and the monastic and religious orders were disbanded. But this was not just only true for the Christian religion, of course. Uh, communism prosecuted other religions as well. Here in Hungary, for example, the Jewish religion, but uh, in the Soviet Union it was uh, true for Buddhism or uh, even Islam. Uh, still, these horrors and many other horrors of communism are not really uh, discussed in, uh, especially in Western Europe and Western countries, unfortunately. Uh, and we can see, still see, uh, sadly, uh, mainstream politicians, serious politicians who say that they are proudly communists. Uh, and we can still see statues erected to Marx or Lenin uh, in some Western European countries. Um, even the former president of the for, former uh, European Commission president Jean Claude uh, Juncker uh, praised Marx's statue, for example, when it was raised. So these things always uh, makes us kind of sad here in uh, in Hungary, and I think generally here in the former Eastern Bloc, because we had to live through the horrors of communism, and that's why we uh, we don't like when these uh, topics are not really addressed properly as they should be. Um, so that's why we're really uh, lucky, I guess, and happy to have this event here at the WB Institute now. And I think this event is going to be m even more interesting because we will have um, stories through the personal stories of three cardinals who were really important uh, during the communist uh, era, uh, these three cardinals being Mincenti, uh, Wisinski, and uh, Stepinac. Uh, all three of them showed uh, with their personal life stories that actually religion can be one of the biggest uh, forces uh, of resistance against all totalitarian regimes uh, because they not just uh, fought against communism but also against Nazism and fascism as well. Uh, and I think this is perhaps most uh, symbolized by Cardinal Mincenti. Uh, I think it's a little known fact that he was uh, already uh, in prison during the first communist dictatorship here in Hungary under Béla Kuhn. So uh, he was uh, basically uh, already arrested uh, several decades before he was tortured by the, the second communist dictatorship. And also he was really the, one of the first people who spoke against the pro-Nazi uh, Arrow Cross uh, party here in Hungary, uh, really aptly calling them the green communists because they were uh, green shirts. Um, so he was uh, a person who stands, really stood up against all forms of, uh, of totalitarian regimes. And I think we couldn't wish for a better speaker than uh, Michael von Habsburg uh, Lutheringian, uh, who is the great grandson of Archduke Josef, um, who we like to call the most Hungarian Habsburg. Um, uh, who, uh, Michael had to fly, flee Hungary during the Second World War and uh, basically lost everything, he and his family, during the communist era. Uh, and being a ref refugee, he led a really eventful life uh, during his exile, eventually becoming a businessman in uh, the textile industry and being really successful in doing that. Uh, sadly, he could only relocate to his beloved country in 1995. Uh, and he has been since involved in many philanthropic organizations. Uh, just to name a few of them, he was the founder of the St. John Paul II School Center, and also he is the president of the Pro Ecclesia Foundation Vaduz. Uh, of course, he has also been a member of the Knights of the Sovereign Military Order of Malta for 50 years, 
and also the ambassador of the order to Hungary for a long time. But of course, his most important role regarding this conference uh, and the main reason why he is with us is that he is the uh, Emiratus president of the Mincenti Foundation, uh, which plays a really integral role uh, in the canonization efforts uh, for Mincenti. So please, Your Excellency, come up to the stage and uh, give us your uh, lecture. Thank you very much. We are a little bit behind time, according to the program, so we have three options. Either I speak, if Mr. President allows, twice the usual <laughs> speed I speak, or there'll be no interval or no dinner. You, you choose. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're very happy to speak at the speed you wish and the length you wish, and we will accommodate ourselves to that. Thank you. Thank, you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> Your Excellencies, Nuncio Apostolico, great honor that you are here. Mr. President, Deputy Director, dear Professor Buttiglioni, a great, great honor that you are here with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, let me thank you, Mr. President of the Danube Institute and also the Batiani Loyosh Foundation for inviting me to speak at this significant conference dedicated to the topic hammer, sickle, and cross. Let me please start with a small bracket, as it is probably not a coincidence that today is the 13th of October, when over 100 years ago, Our Lady appeared for the sixth and last time to three shepherd children in Fatima. On this very day in 1972, Cardinal Mincenti led a group of Hungarian pilgrims to the shrine of Our Lady and had the unique privilege to see and talk to Sister Lucia, the last of the living children to have seen and talked to Our Lady 100 years earlier. This was to leave an everlasting impact on Cardinal Mincenti. We are living in a restless time where people are constantly on the run, where people are constantly distracted, and it is vitally important to remind future generations of the past, of the experiences of our parents and grandparents, made so as not to forget, and at the same time, to allow to learn the lessons from the past. I am very happy that this conference can now take place because it will greatly contribute to this goal in spite of all the confusions caused by the COVID virus, which in fact turned your plans, but also those of most of the world upside down. I must admit that for many of us, this time also had its positive aspects. Families grew together again. Families learned to cope with each other again. For us, the elderly, it was the lovely experience to be cared for and looked after lovingly by wonderful children and grandchildren. Once again, it proved that God has the talent to turn a disaster into a blessing. Not that God wanted this disaster, but he had the aftermath, the consequences in mind. The lesson we all learned from this is that man always thinks he can master everything, that he can plan his life, but God's ways are different. Let me start my talk with a general reflection on the fate of humanity since the beginning of time. All through history, mankind has been subject to the everlasting battle between good and evil, a battle which rages not only in the world around us, but also within each single one of us in a lifetime of decisions taken according to the free will that God has entrusted us. The 20th century was a time when evil seemed to be on the winning side. The National Socialist and the Communist dictatorships, the allies of evil, could unhindered spread their reigns of terror and destruction. But in the end, 
Evil, fortunately, never will win, as God has assured us. A godless epoch cannot last forever. Before entering into my topic, please allow me a review, a flashback in history to better understand the subject. At the end of World War II, took place mainly two conferences which decided on the fate of Central Europe. This was the Treaty of Yalta in February 1944, 1945, and before it, the fourth Moscow conference in October 1944, in which Winston Churchill made a secret proposal to Stalin on a scrap of paper dividing post-war Europe into Western and Soviet spheres of influence, and which Stalin agreed to. This incredible scrap of paper still exists, although Stalin wanted to destroy it. Fact is that this agreement led, as a consequence, to the 100% occupation also of Hungary by Soviet troops. With Hungary occupied, it was only a question of time until the Communist Party would manage to take control of Parliament and subsequently of the whole country. On the 29th March 1892, in a small village in Western Hungary called Csehimincent, at that time still part of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, was born a boy of peasant stock named Jozef Pem. He was one of six children who later adopted the name Mincenti, taken from his place of birth and meaning all saints. Age 20, he was ordained priest in 1915, and in 1919, during the communist takeover under Bela Kuhn, or Korn, was imprisoned for the first time. 1944, Pope Pius XII appointed him Bishop of Vesprim, where because of his standing out for the Jews, he was jailed for the second time, as he urged his followers to vote against the Nazi Arrow Cross Party, which he characterized as evil as the communists. Mincenti remained in prison until April 1945, when the Soviet army liberated Hungary, as it was called. He emerged a national hero, not only for Catholics, but also for Protestants because of his consistent resistant resistance to tyranny. On the 15th of September 1945, Pope Pius XII named him Archbishop of Estergom. At this time, Hungary was still a monarchy, and according to the Constitution, the primate of the Catholic Church, in the absence of the king, was the first man in the state. Cardinal Mincenti was very much aware of his role within the church, but also of his responsibility towards the nation. In his homily as new Archbishop of Estergom, he said, let us now be the nation of prayer. If we learn again how to pray, it will give us strength and confidence. I trust in the crusade of those millions who pray, and I trust in the rosary that my mother will hold even more tightly in her hands. Don't lose your courage. Your courage. Let us defend our unshakable belief. I want to be the conscience of my nation, and I will keep knocking on the door of your souls and will continue to transmit the eternal truth to my people. On 21st of February 1946, he was elevated to the rank of cardinal by Pope Pius XII, who during his consecration in Rome told him, among these 32 new cardinals, you will be the first to suffer martyrdom symbolized by the purple color of your vestment. How prophetic. Shortly after his return from Rome, Hungary was declared a republic and the persecution of religion and the church schools slowly began. Mincenti saw it as his duty to protest wherever he could against the growing wave of anti-clericalism. He wrote letters to the government and the Bishop's Conference issued declarations condemning the restriction of the freedom of religion. In 1947, the communists, through, through cunning maneuvering, were able to take over the political power. As an answer to the threat that was overshadowing the country, Cardinal Mincenti decided to declare a year consecra consecrated to Our Lady, a Marian year, which was inaugurated in Estergom on the 15th of August, 1947. It reminded all Hungarians of St. Stephen, their first king, who offered his crown and his country to Our Lady equally on the 15th of August, but more than 900 years earlier in 1038. 
In the course of that year, Cardinal Mincenti was able to mobilize the masses whom he invited to visit the shrines of Our Lady, in spite of all efforts and threats made by the communists to prevent this. On the 8th of September alone, 1.8 million pilgrims were counted and 1.1 million communions distributed. A few days later, on 14th of September, Cardinal Mincenti himself led 100,000 men to Maria Remete, where he declared that Satan is a living reality. He is the evil, he is the liar, he is the tempter and the destroyer of humanity. On Corpus Christi, 2.3 million Catholics took part in the ceremonies. Altogether that year, four million pilgrims followed the Cardinal's call. This was an unbearable blow to the new rulers, and from now on the primate became their absolute enemy number one. Excuse me, it's not only the emotion, it's uh, my three eye operations. The fight against the church entered a new phase. In 1948, all 4,113 Catholic schools were nationalized, all convents closed, priests and nuns deported. The cardinal drove from village to village, urging his faithful to ignore the communist orders and refused to give up their schools and their land. In every village as he arrived, all the bells tolled. Although the publication of his pastoral letter was banned, one copy somehow made its way to the Voice of America radio broadcast, and the communists shouted, subversive activity. The November 1948 letter ended, I stand for God, for the church, and for Hungary. Compared with the sufferings of my people, my own faith is of no importance. I do not accuse my accusers. I pray for those who, in the words of our Lord, know not what they do. I forgive them from the bottom of my heart. Explaining that neither he nor the church had provoked the enmity of the Hungarian government, he wrote in an open letter in December, communism is an atheistic ideology. Hence, by its very nature, it is opposed to the spirit of the church. Mincenti never stopped to fearlessly and openly protest, and it was only a question of time until on the 26th of December 1948, in front of his terrified mother, he was arrested. As the officers of the secret police approached, he scribbled a note telling his fellow priests not to believe if they heard that he had resigned or confessed. He donned his poorest bishop's robe and his simplest bishop's ring. In his pocket was a picture of Jesus crowned with a crown of thorns. On it, the giver inscribed, De Victus Vincit, that is, defeated he is victorious. That picture, was to comfort him all throughout his darkest hours. He was dragged off to the headquarters of the secret police in the feared Andrashi Road number 60, today rightly called the House of Terror Museum, accused of treason, conspiracy, and other offenses against the new People's Republic of Hungary. By pure coincidence, a few days ago, um, my very nice secretary in the Min City Foundation uh, because I, I baptized uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, since, managed to find out where this little image came from that Mincenti had with him uh, all the time and which plays such an important role in, our, in the history of our foundation. And she managed to find a convent in the Normandie in France where um, the image um, or the little statue um, uh, exists and from which uh, this uh, image was made and sent by someone from France to the cardinal shortly before he was arrested and so on. So it's a pure coincidence or not that, uh, that we now know, and I spoke to the convent and I spoke to the man in charge there, and we're going to have copies of it made for all our different museums. This was to be the beginning of Cardinal Mincenti's Calvary. At the notorious prison, the cardinal was interrogated relentlessly for 29 consecutive days and nights not being allowed to sleep, which he himself said was the worst ordeal of all, not being allowed to sleep for 29 consecutive days. They tortured, humiliated him, they brainwashed him with the most diabolical methods of mind-altering tactics 
that the communists had been perfecting for years. The drugs were put in his food to break his will. Twice a night he was beaten all over his body with a rubber truncheon until unconscious. On the 30th day, Cardinal Mincenti underwent what is today called a mock trial. The principal aim was to confuse the Catholic circles in Hungary in the sense of the holy writing, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. What he had predicted happened. He confessed the charges against him and was sentenced to life imprisonment. Under his confessions, he would sign adding a little CF Asked by his interrogators what the meeting was, he answered Cardinalis Foranios, which means a provincial cardinal. In fact, the meaning was coactus fecit, which means I was forced to do it, making all his confessions invalid. Under all other circumstances, Cardinal Mincenti would have been sentenced to death, but his accusers knew exactly that they would have automatically made a hero out of him, and this was to be avoided at all costs. Mincenti's trial put a human face on the moral struggle between East and West. The free world finally recognized the Soviet Union for, for what it really was. The fate of one Catholic priest had become of profound interest to the whole world. Pope Pius XII, who had foreseen this tragedy, called the Cardinal's arrest in front of the whole world, a serious outrage on every upholder of the dignity and liberty of man. This was the first time that the outside world became aware of the significance of the Hungarian cardinal. New York Cardinal Spellman roared, if this be treason to deny allegiance to an atheistic communist government, then thank God Cardinal Mincenti confessed to treason. He was fast becoming a Cold War cult figure for his valiant stand against atheistic communism. He was featured on the 14th of February 1949 cover of Time magazine. The first film, Guilty of Treason, was produced, as just mentioned, as early as 1950. A priest suffering torture for his faith might not have been a popular subject among Hollywood's elite, but it resonated well at the box offices, especially with millions of Catholics who loved to go to the movies. The second film, which we just saw a clip of, was produced in 1955, The Prisoner, with Alec Guinness in the title role. On the 8th of February, 1949, Mincenti's battered body was brought to the first prison, and from there on to many others. No one was supposed to know of his whereabouts. His mother was only allowed to see him three times in all those years of confinement. She saw his health slowly deteriorating, his weight decreasing from 88 to 42 kilos. For over one year, the cardinal was not allowed to celebrate mass in his prison cell. It was in the Marco Street prison where he probably spent the longest time that an event took place which Mincenti himself does not mention anywhere, but another saint, Padre Pio does. In fact, in the convent of San Giovanni Rotondo, there is a mosaic depicting the scene. As you probably know, the phenomenon of bilocation is one of the most remarkable gifts attributed to Padre Pio, which enabled him to be present in two places at the same time. This was the case when he visited Cardinal Mincenti and celebrated mass with him in his prison cell. Padre Pio did not like to speak about it, but the stigmatized Capuchin, when asked once, said, referring to the maltreatment of the cardinal, that the cardinal suffered, the devil is ugly, but they had left him uglier than the devil. This shows that Padre Pio had, had that Padre Pio had, humanly speaking, um, sorry, that Padre Pio had brought him help from the beginning of his time in prison because, humanly speaking, one cannot conceive how the cardinal was able to resist all the suffering to which he was subject and which he describes in his memoirs. Padre Pio concluded, remember to pray for that great confessor of the faith who suffered so much for the church. Here I would like to mention a prophecy which is attributed to Padre Pio, well known to Hungarians, but there is no proof of it. It says, Hungary is like a cage, out of which one day a beautiful bird will fly out. Hungary will have to endure a lot of suffering, but will also receive great glory in all of Europe. I envy the Hungarians, says the prophet, 
because through them one day great happiness will flow over all of humanity. Let's hope so. Historical research today calls Mincenti one of the leading personalities not only of the church but of Hungarian history of the last centuries. If we think back during communist rule for over 40 years, his name was not even allowed to be mentioned and today he is feasted all over the country. The cardinal himself once said, time is the best ally of truth. He sacrificed all his life for the truth. The price he paid was 23 years in dungeons, prisons, and isolation. Thus he became the symbol of resistance against the totalitarian regimes of the 20th century against the brown and the red dictatorships. He was the Fidelissimus Pastor, the faithful shepherd, who in spite of being persecuted, never gave up to fight for his herd, never gave up to be its leader and motivator. In spite of all the terrible suffering he went through when he was liberated on 30th of October 1956, his first words to the waiting crowd of journalists were, I carry no hatred or grudge towards anyone in my heart. These are the words of a saint. Today, 70 years on, all the self-imposed rulers and dictators of those days have sunk into oblivion. Who still remembers their names? What happens to the torturers, to the tormentors of Mincenti? Who still knows Jula Deci? Where is Gabor Peter? Who still hears of Vilmos Olti? They are forgotten. They have disappeared. And on the other hand, their victim, the one they wanted to plunge into darkness, shines, to die, shines today brighter than during his lifetime. Statues are being erected for him, books written, conferences as today's, and pilgrimages organized in his memory, to which more and more young people come. And thanks to the work of the Mincenti Foundation these last 30 years, the preparations for his beatification are reaching their final stage. Since many years, now over one million faithful in and outside Hungary are praying for this to happen. Mincenti, once in the Marian year of 1947, said, if there will be one million Hungarians who pray, I will no longer be afraid for the future. This, is in fact, this in fact became the motto of our foundation, the inspiration of all our efforts and work. Where does the beatification stand today? On the 14th of June, 2018, the Consulta de Theology, the six expert Vatican theologians, after studying the complete documentation of the cause, unanimously recognized that Cardinal Mincenti had lived the virtues in a heroic way, recognizing the sainthood of his life. As a result, on 12th of February 2019, Pope Francis signed the first important <coughs> decree declaring the Cardinal to be venerable. Deo gratias. Thanks be to God. On 23rd of October 1956, the fight for freedom in Budapest started. Freedom from a totalitarian state, freedom from an inhuman regime of terror and suppression that had lasted eight full years. Freedom from occupation by a merciless army whose presence was a constant humiliation to the population. The fight was initiated by students not wanting to believe in the lies they were being taught by students wanting to know the truth. They set off against the Soviet tanks, armed only with pitchforks and Molotov cocktails, tinkered at home, but with a conviction to defeat the much-hated occupier. Soon they were joined by the masses and even the army. The communists were taken totally by surprise and in a short time fled. They fled also because Western states, including the USA, promised help. Not one Soviet soldier, not one Soviet tank remained in the country. On 30th of October, Cardinal Mincenti was freed from his last prison in Felschöpetin by a group of officers from the nearby barrack in Rechag, led by Major Antol Palinkas. This man was of aristocratic descent, but he changed his name from Count Palavicini into Palinkas in order to break with the past and with all traditions as he became a convinced communist. Fate wanted it that he should be there and then in this historic moment when he became the liberator of Mincenti. For this act of courage, after the crushing of the revolution, Palinkas was executed by his own people. 
Mincent, he was brought in triumph to Budapest Square. From the radio station on 3rd of November, he held a patriotic speech to the, na to the nation. The Soviets soon saw that no one was coming to help Hungary, and on the 4th of November, sent back their tanks, which once more invaded the capital, leaving behind them to utter destruction. Mincenti, dodging the Soviet tanks, just had time to seek refuge in the nearest embassy to the parliament where he was leading discussions with all concerned, and that was the then legation of the US. Within only 30 minutes, President Eisenhower granted asylum to the cardinal. Mincenti was to spend the next 15 years at the legation, later embassy, totally isolated from the outside world, behind closed windows, closed shutters, and drawn curtains. In fact, his room today is the office, the working room of the ambassador, and I would have liked to, to thank, thank the ambassador if he would have been here to, uh, for all what uh, he did and his embassy did and his country did to Mincenti for 15 years. The agreement was that he was not to be seen from the outside and he was not allowed to see out. A daily 20-minute walk in the inner concrete courtyard was the only exercise allowed in 15 years. His incredible tenacity made him survive also this ordeal. He didn't lose time and started to learn English, but mainly he wrote his memoirs, which are winding up with communism and its methods. These were to be translated into all languages and gave enlightenment to the world on what communism really was. On the 28th of February, on the 28th of September 1971, due to pressure from all sides, the US, the Vatican, the Soviet Union, and Hungary, the cardinal had become a problem for all. Mincenti took the most difficult decision in his life to obey the call of the Holy Father and to leave his beloved homeland forever. After 15 years, he stepped out on Freedom Square gave a last blessing to his country, got into the motor car with Nuncio Rossi, and was rushed off incognito to Vienna airport. He was flown to Rome and driven to the Vatican. Here, Pope Paul VI received him with an embrace, after which the Pope took off his own pectoral cross and put it around the Cardinal's neck. After concelebrating Mass with the Holy Father and meeting the Cardinals, Tisserand, Ottaviani, Wyszynski, Cicognani, Seppa, Wright, Döpfner, Höfner, and Cook, as well as the world press, the primate, took the decision not to stay in Rome, but to travel to Vienna and stay in the Pasmaneum, a Hungarian seminar, his exile for the last four years of his life. Cardinal Mincenti spent the time he was still given to travel around the world and visit all Hungarian communities to comfort and encourage his countrymen. On the 6th of May, 1975, upon returning to Vienna from a South American trip, he fell ill, was operated, and died aged 83 years. According to his will, he was buried in the Basilica Maria Zell, a shrine common to Austrians, Hungarians, and Slav nations. At the funeral, Father Werenfried van Straten bade goodbye with the following words. God tested him. The way of the cross he had to go, no other cardinal had to go before him. He went with exemplary fidelity, without hatred for his persecutors, but also without consideration, without considering evasion or escape, which might have made life easier for him. He faithfully followed his Lord, because where Christ was, also his servant had to be. He suffered unspeakably. He had to suffer even more under the cross that he called the heaviest of his life when he had to leave his beloved homeland. God tested him and found him worthy. We dare to say now, corona aura super caput eius. A crown of gold was on his head. For blessed are those who suffer persecution for the sake of justice, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Hungarians, listen to your cardinal. He is not dead. His soul is in God's hand, and no agony, no anguish can harm him anymore. The hour has come for him to be glorified with the Son of God, with the Son of Man. On the 3rd of May 1991, according to his testament and last will, we were able to transfer the earthly remains of the cardinal to his final resting place in the Basilica of Estergom. 
It was a conduct in triumph. Thousands lined the streets and roads and hundreds of thousands welcomed their cardinal home after 20 years of exile. When the final judgment of Cardinal Mincenti's historic, historical significance is made, it will surely conclude that his time as a prisoner of the communists was one of the greatest periods of his life. It was certainly the most influential since it informed the whole world of the real nature of, Stalinism, of Stalinist communism in the most dramatic form. Now communism no longer threatens, it, threatens us, at least in this part of the world, but the suffering and example of Cardinal Josef Mincenti, but also Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski, Aloysius Stepinak, and Joseph Beran will remain present in all minds and for all times. Sanguis martyrum semen Christianorum, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of Christians. This applies to the cardinals, but also to all those endless rows of martyrs and victims who have laid the foundation which has permitted the post-communist countries to resurrect, recover, and rebuild. In a Western Europe where today faith is weakening, we can notice that in Central and Eastern Europe, it has remained strong, producing Christian governments not afraid of defending their traditions, their families, and their beliefs. Hungary has a new constitution since April 2011, replacing the communist one valid since 1949, and which begins with the words, God. It protects marriage as between man and woman, full stop. It protects the families and life with a capital L until its natural end. Let me conclude with an extract from a speech given by our Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, which clearly states what Hungary stands for today. When we draw the boundaries of our identity, we mark our Christian culture as the source of our pride and sustaining strength. Christianity is a culture and a civilization. It is within this that we live. Culture is the reality of everyday life, how to speak and behave towards one another, the distance we keep from one another, and not only in COVID times, and how we approach one another, how we enter this world and how we leave it. For European people, Christian culture determines the morals of our daily lives. In borderline situations, this gives us a benchmark and a compass. Amidst the contradictions of life, Christian culture shows us the way. It determines our understanding of justice and injustice. The relationship between men and women, family, success, work, and honor. We Europeans are Christians. Hitherto, we see it as, a we see it as natural that Jesus was born, died on the cross for us, and then rose from the dead. Can you imagine any other prime minister saying that today? For us, our religious feasts are self-evident, and we look to them to give meaning to our everyday lives. Christian culture is similar to the human body's immune system. As long as it is working properly, we do not even notice it. It becomes noticeable and important to us when it is weakened, when crosses are airbrushed from photographs, when people seek to remove the cross from a statue of St. Paul, uh, St. John Paul II, for example, when they try to change how we celebrate our feasts, then every right-thinking European bristles with anger. We cannot claim that Christian culture is the peak of perfection. This is precisely the key to Christian culture. We are aware of imperfection, including our own imperfection, but we have learned to live with this, to draw inspiration from it, and derive impetus from it. This is why for centuries we Europeans have been striving to improve the world, the gift born by imperfection is that we are given the opportunity to improve. Those who promise a beautiful new mixed world now want to take this opportunity away from us. Now they also want to destroy everything that we must preserve for future generations. Our duty to do so is derived from the knowledge that when called to do so, our ancestors shed blood to preserve it for us. As long as my government leads the country, we shall work intelligently, calmly, but uncompromisingly to ensure that our homeland remains a Christian culture and a Hungarian country. And we shall do our utmost to ensure that Europe remains European. Thank you for your long attention.
So Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for this very detailed and uh, even visual uh, speech about the extraordinary life of Cardinal Mincenti. Uh, and also, uh, I personally wish you uh, success with the canonization efforts for me and Santi. I hope your uh, efforts will bring success. Uh, now we will turn quickly towards Poland, uh, which of course provided, uh, I guess, the strongest resistance towards the communist regime in uh, all of the Eastern European countries. Uh, and Cardinal uh, Primate of Poland, uh, Stefan Wyszynski, played a real cru really crucial role uh, in this um, resistance. L luckily, we have uh, one of the most eminent experts of uh, the Cardinal here with us, Associate Professor Rafał Latka. Uh, Professor Latka holds a doctorate uh, in social sciences in the field of political sciences. And uh, he is also a researcher uh, at the Institute of National Re uh, Remembrance. Uh, where he's uh, the coordinator of the research project that basically deals with what we are discussing now, uh, the communist authorities towards churches, churches and religious associations in Poland uh, during communism. He is, uh, of course, also an author and uh, a journalist, uh, and he co-authored uh, and edited uh, a huge amount of books, 24 if I see correctly. Um, a lot of them are actually uh, uh, related to the topic which we are discussing uh, about the communist crimes of, of, against Christians, but he also wrote, of course, a book about uh, the cardinal himself. So I would like to kindly uh, invite you to uh, the panel, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, you have to give me a uh, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, to the side. Can we ask for some technical uh, help here? Yes, uh, for we don't. Password. We don't have a password to. <laughs> sorry. Oh, no, no problem. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, it is a great honor to be here to present some part of my research about Cardinal Wyszyński. Uh, it will be a short presentation about the role of the great monumental figures of Polish Church. Uh, it will be about uh, uh, Cardinal Wyszyński and the Pope of the John Paul II, also in the time when he was a Cardinal Wojtyla, uh, second, uh, second bishop in uh, Poland. Uh, let me start for the small introduction. Small introduction, uh, it is obvious for uh, people uh, who are here, who are for, from specialists about uh, church relations in Europe, uh, but it uh, has to be underlined that for thousands of years the church has played a unique role in Poland. It was engaged not only in a religious activity, but also for a number of centuries, it was also active in the field of education, social and charitable operations, especially when the Poland is not a state, but uh, the uh, nation of Polish uh, have always been supported by church heralds, by the priest, and uh, uh, it was uh, crucial to um, uh, survive the identity of Polish. Uh, it was a, a crucial role of a Catholic church. Uh, I, will, uh, I will be talking about to a big uh, person about uh, Cardinal Wyszyński and Cardinal Wojtyla. Uh, it was, uh, I, we have to start about a short basic biographical information about these uh, two uh, hierarchs. Uh, they, they came from different and uh, different generation and had slightly different life experience. 
Stefan Wyszyński was active in social life during the Second Polish Republic. Uh, he had uh, to hide during World War II. He, was, uh, he had been searched for Gestapo. Uh, Karol Wojtyła in turn attended adulthood almost exactly when the war broke out in 1939. During the German occupation, he worked physically and studied in a sacred seminary. Stefan Wyszyński, born in a, uh, in a Podlasie, in a small village, it is uh, Zuzela, uh, it, is on the, uh, it was on the Russian uh, occupation. He was uh, a son of church organist, uh, he came from a uh, poor family. Uh, he has uh, been studying in the seminary in Wrocław. Um, he chose especially this seminary because uh, it was on a high level and a social, uh, and a social uh, teaching specialist. He ordinated priest in 1924. Uh, he uh, studied in a, a Catholic University of Lublin. Uh, he get a doctorate uh, in a canon law, but he was, uh, he was also a specialist in social sciences. Karol uh, Voltua in a turn, he had uh, born in 1920 in Małopolska, in Badowice, it's a small city near Krakow. Uh, he was son of the soldier of Polish army, a son of a uh, father who have uh, fought in a, a Polish Bolshevik uh, um, battle. Uh, he was a, a cleric in the seminary in Krakow. It was uh, uh, in the Second World War II sacred seminary. He uh, had ordained a priest in 1946. Uh, his, uh, uh, he had uh, uh, he has uh, habited doctor, philosopher, and theologian. Uh, now, uh, now uh, we have a, a say, say a few words about the fields of knowledge of uh, these two uh, these two persons. Stefan Wyszyński focus on the social teaching of the church. Uh, Karol Wojtyła was a philosopher and ethics. He was also at, at an outstanding intellectual. This had some consequence in different approach to some social political issues. Um, let us briefly present the cause of the ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical career, which at some point crossed and they began a fruitful cooperation between Stefan Wyszyński and Karol Wojtyła. I will talk about it in a detail later in my paper. Stefan Wyszyński uh, was a priest in the Wrocław Diocese. He was also editor, publicist, lecturer in the seminary and Christian workers university. He uh, is uh, a, an author of uh, 100 uh, uh, scientific, uh, scientific publication about social teaching of uh, Catholic Church. Uh, he, uh, after World War II, he was a diocesan bishop in Lublin. Uh, he was uh, uh, there uh, uh, for two years, and after this, he was a, a Archbishop of Gniezno and Warsaw, Primat of Poland, and uh, get a cardinal nomination in 1953. Uh, in turn, Karol Wojtyła was priest in a Krakow diocese, and also a lecturer in seminary, a lecturer in a Catholic University of Lublin, and academic uh, chaplain. He was also a publicist uh, and ethic. He was, in 1958 to 1964, auxiliary bishops in Krakow. Uh, and after that, he uh, get a nomination to Metropolitan uh, Archbishop of Krakow. Uh, he nominated uh, Cardinal 1967. He was obviously a pope in this year, 1978 to 2005. Uh, now, uh, before I go to the further consider consideration about the figures of my purpose, I must briefly outline the historical context because it is important to uh, understand the situation of these two great uh, person, two great figures of uh, Polish church. Uh, in Tehran and Yalta, 
the governments of the United States, Great Britain and Soviet Union, decided that Poland border should be moved to the west, and millions of Poles were deported, which was branded rep uh, repatriation. Poland lost uh, Kresy Wschodnie uh, with Lviv and Vilnius and moved to the west and get some cities uh, which was uh, German before, like Wrocław or Szczecin. Poland, under the rule of communists, planning to build a secular state, hostile to every religion, based on an ideology of Marxist-Leninist. The church became, uh, in this uh, situation, one of the main opponents of the communists. For this reason, he was ruthlessly fought by the state apparatus and uh, security uh, all the time, from uh, 1940 Five to 1989, it was uh, a fought by state apparatus. The Polish communist government was completely dependent on the Soviet Union, also in the field of anti-church policy. Uh, there was a, a state situation uh, to the uh, 1989. Uh, let's, uh, I, uh, I will be talking uh, about the situation of church in Poland after World War II. Uh, there were very painful losses for uh, church in Poland. Around 3,000 priests, several hundred monks and nuns were killed in military operation, in concentration camps, labor camps and prison. Uh, in the occupied Poland also the Catholic Church played an important key role in maintaining Polish national identity. For this reason, it had great social authority. It was the case uh, for the entire period of communist rule in Poland until 1989. In the years, the first years of communism in Poland, 1945-1948, the church in Poland rebuilt its structures, although some of them were temporary. It was Western and Northern territories until 1972. It was a field of conflict between a Polish and German church, which Holy See uh, finally resolved uh, in 1972. It was a conflict about what's uh, going on with uh, uh, Western and Northern territories. Uh, there was not, uh, it was a temporary situation. As a, as a result of the uh, World War II and territorial changes connected with that, the vast majority of Poles were Catholics. It uh, reached 95% of uh, Polish people. Um, now uh, we are going to the, rule, the, to the role of Primat Wyszyński for the Polish Church and Polish nation. Uh, I will uh, concentrate it on the most important issue of this problem and uh, giving uh, you the most uh, um, simple information about his role. Uh, he, a wise approach to the communist state uh, meant the church survived the most difficult period of massive repression. It was a policy of flexible response for communist repressions, keeping the limit of concession of church towards uh, communist government. Uh, he concluded the uh, agreement with the communist authorities in April uh, 1950, despite the opposition of part po of Polish Episcopate and the skepticism of the Holy See. He was approved after that in 1951, after his visit in uh, Vatican, and get uh, permission of uh, Pius, uh, tw Pius XII to his policy. As a result of opposition to attempt in in, in the church by issuing a decree of influence authorities feeding church post in Poland, he was arrested on September 25 in 1953. Uh, the, uh, in, uh, he was in isolation for three uh, consecutive, consecutive years. Uh, uh, the primate uh, survived this period of improvement, uh, uh, this, this period of improvement without reflecting on his fate. Instead, he prepared uh, two key pastoral programs, the Jasna Gura Wolves of the nation and the Great Novena, which, will be, which I uh, will be talking about uh, later. After leaving the improvement, 
Pyma Dwyszyński enjoyed the great authority. He was surrounded by the halo of martyr. And also his position in Polish church, in Polish episcopate, was not uh, more questioned. Uh, what should uh, be emphasized and underlined? In the uh, next years, in the next nine years, 1957, 1966, he implemented the Great Novena program, the aim of which was not only to deepen the Catholic faith, but also to stretch the morality of Poles. The highlight of the program was 1966, the millennium anniversary of Christianity in Poland. Uh, in the implementation of the Novena program, the payment met with the contraction of the authorities, which organizes co comparative celebration of the millennium of Polish statehood. The clash of two visions of Poland, a Catholic introduced by Cardinal Wyszyński, and socialist introduced by Władysław Gomułka, ended with the victory of the church. As a result, the authority of the church increased again, and that authority of the communist authorities dropped significant, significantly. Um, in the last decade of Cardinal Wyszyński's life, his social authority was unquestionable. The primus was respected by all Polish society, and also by communists, not only Polish, but the Soviet too. Uh, the influence of the church uh, on the communist authorities increased uh, significantly in the Edward Gierek uh, decade. Uh, Edward, uh, his, uh, this his first secretary of communist party in Poland was forced to take into account the opinion of the episcopate. It was especially evident, for example, during the um, amendment to the constitution of the Polish People's Republic in 1976, when the authorities due to the pressure of the Episcopate resi resigned from some of the planned constitutional provisions. In 1976, organization opposing to the communist regime appeared in uh, freedoms, but didn't support their effort to change the political system in Polish, uh, in Pop People's Republic of Poland. He had the similar attitude to the, uh, to the movement of solidarity, which uh, came in 1980. Although without his in involvement, agricultural solidarity wouldn't have been established. He forced it on the party authorities. Now a few words about the role of the Karol Wojtyła uh, when he was a priest and after that he was a Cardinal Metropolitan uh, of Krakow. He was one of the precursors of academic chaplaincy in Poland. He was in this time an outstanding intellectual in the fields of ethics. Uh, he was a lecturer in the Catholic University of Lublin. And after that, uh, he was uh, in 1958, 1964, Vicar General and most important uh, collaborator of us, Bishop Eugeniusz Baziak, a Metropolitan of Krakow. With the time, it was uh, he who actually managed the Krakow archaeodiotis due to the illness of his superior. He was also an efficient diocesan bishop as a metropolitan bishop of Krakow. He enjoyed a great authority among the clergy and believers. He was also a, be able to efficiently deal with conflict situation which provoked by party authorities in the region of Małopolska. He was on the was, he was on he was one of the most important Polish representatives during the Second Vatican Council. And after that, he became a recon recognizable figure in the Universal Church. He was also, after that, in the uh, decades of 70s, uh, he was a figure of the Universal Church, a close associate of Pope Paul uh, VI. Uh, he was only uh, one of the few bishops in Poland who uh, gave his patronize and uh, support to the opposition, to the anti-communist opposition in his uh, the last years of, as a metropolitan on Krakow in 1976-1978. And he had a close contact with some of the opposition leaders, especially, especially leaders from, uh, from uh, Krakow. Uh, there, there is a, um, 
a short, uh, short underline about uh, fields of co cooperation between Cardinal Wyszyński and Cardinal Wojtyła in these years when they uh, collaborate on the, uh, in the Episcope of Poland. Uh, consistent and close cooperation, it was especially in the work of Episcope, uh, with time Karol Wojtyła becoming the number two uh, in the Polish church. He served as a vice president of the Episcope from 1969. Uh, the compilant and fruitful cooperation during the Second Vatican Council, uh, Council brings the Polish Church, uh, the authority in the uh, common uh, church. The Episcope act as a united group with the same position on the various issues. It was uh, crucial to uh, the uh, situation in other churches. Uh, churches. The Episcopal uh, Karol Wojtyła played a particularly important role in the international Episcopal context, especially, especially in the field of relations with the Holy See. Primat Wyszyński saw him as his successor, is evidenced by his memoirs, uh, which were edited now in Poland. Uh, there is a big uh, big scientific uh, project which uh, bring to uh, edit all of the um, uh, memoirs of the Cardinal Wyszyński. Despite the action of the security apparatus, they didn't fall apart of any important issues. In the years 1964, 1978, a great campaign of, of divergence between the two years was carried out. It turned out to uh, be completely ineffective uh, because of the uh, attitude of these two heroes. Uh, now, the period of 1978 to 1981, uh, this uh, second uh, date is uh, about the death of Cardinal Wyszyński. Uh, it, we have to underline the important role of Cardinal Wyszyński in election of Karol Wojtyła as a pope. This was uh, evident from the journal of Cardinal Wyszyński. We can find some, um, some information about it, but probably never know the exact details about this problem. Jean Paul II introduced significant changes in the Inter policy of the Vatican uh, uh, after some advices from Cardinal Wyszyński. Church have been demanding the rights of the believers in the countries of Soviet bloc. Uh, the, crucial, uh, the crucial element of collaboration in this period, it was the first pilgrimage of John Paul II to Poland in 1979. And his great role to the social awakening of Poles. It also simulates religious, religiousness in the countries behind the Iron Curtain. Um, Pope John Paul II and Primat Wyszyński uh, also support uh, support uh, the changes in Poland in 1980-1981. The unique bond of these uh, two heroes were visible, especially when the murder attempt on the Holy Father and the last moments of Cardinal Wyszyński life in May 1981. Uh, now uh, I can I, I will. Uh, I will talk uh, a few words about the role of the John Paul II in the years 1981, 1992. Uh, the, this uh, second date is about the um, uh, situation in the uh, territory of the decision in Poland, uh, which uh, John Paul II uh, changed uh, after the suggestion of the Polish Church. He, in this period, constituently supported Poland during the martial law period, uh, he constant concern of, uh, of uh, his nation. Uh, the crucial is was also two papal pilgrimage to Poland in 1983 and 1987. They uh, held up Paul to hopes for change. He supported uh, also the solidarity opposition in Poland in many, in many ways. Uh, he planned, uh, he played uh, the important role of uh, bringing about the fall of communism. He carried out the reorganization of the structures in Catholic Church in Poland in 1992. He, he is always pay uh, big attention to democratic change in Poland to his uh, to end of his life. Uh, a short conclusion and remarks. 
Without Pai Matbyszyński and Kardynał Karol Wojtyła, Pope uh, Paul John Paul II, Polish history uh, would have been completely different. Um, the wise policy of Pai Matbyszyński allowed not only the church to survive, but also significantly increase the social authority of this institution. The program of Great Novena was crucial for achieving this result, achieving this situation that Pol are Catholics now. Uh, extremely important for Polish nation was also, the, it is obvious, uh, was uh, the election of Cardinal Wojtyła as a Pope in 1978 uh, and his pil pil first pilgrimage to Poland in 1979. The Pope also contributed the peaceful transformation of the political system in Poland and look more broadly to the Eastern Bloc. Thank you very much for your attention. For your attention. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I think we learned a lot about uh, both Polish uh, persons, um, both of them who really played a crucial role um, in, the, in the fight against communism. Uh, last but not least, uh, we will turn to uh, the former Yugoslavia, uh, especially Croatia, um, which we perhaps don't know as much about as uh, most of the other Eastern European countries because uh, it was mostly considered as a more free and liberal country uh, under the Tito uh, regime, but of course it was still hostile towards religion, uh, especially Catholics um, in Slovenia and Croatia. That's why it's going to be really interesting to hear about uh, more about Cardinal uh, Stepinac. Um, of course, it might surprise you that we have uh, a person who has an English name, <laughs> Dr. Robin, Robin Harris, uh, but I can assure you that he is one of the foremost experts on, on Stepinac, uh, on the Cardinal, um, and he has been living for years in, in Croatia, and is currently now the Vice President of the Croatian Center for Renewal of Culture. Um, he started out uh, in British politics uh, from 1978. He was a member of the Conservative Party's research department, of which he later became a director. And during the, uh, the 80s, he was a special advisor at the Treasury and then at the Home Office, and finally a member of Margaret Thatcher's uh, Downing Street uh, Policy Unit. Uh, I guess that's where John met him as well. Um, uh, he left government with, uh, with Fetcher and helped her later also uh, with his advice. Um, he wrote speeches for her and uh, he helped her, with, uh, helped her with her books basically and her memoirs. Um, uh, he was later awarded the CBA uh, for political and public service in the UK. Uh, he also received an order of the Croatian Morning Star uh, in 2008 um, from the Croatian government. Uh, and also in 2017, the Adria Buivina Prize for Outstanding Services to Christian Culture. Uh, he wrote, of course, several books. Uh, the most important for this event is his book about uh, the Cardinal, his life and times. Um, but he also wrote several books about uh, creation, uh, for example, the, the history of Dubrovnik, uh, but also a biography about uh, Margaret Thatcher as well. So I would like to kindly welcome uh, Dr. Robin Harris uh, up to the stage, and um, we are very much looking forward for your speech about uh, the Cardinal. Thank you. Can I turn this flat? Yes. Or not? So. Um, but you're also. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Actually, it's probably this is more practical here. Whatever it is, is it's fine. I'd like a glass of water. I'd like that. Of course. Yeah. Yeah.
Can I be heard now? Yes. Good. Well, as I say, um, it's not just a strange fact that this is an Englishman speaking, but also I suppose it's quite strange that an Englishman got to be so interested in this subject. I'll very briefly tell you why. And that is that um, having become convinced, as Englishmen are inclined to, uh, of the justice of a particular situation, this was the justice of Croatia's War of Independence in 1991, uh, I started to read everything that I could about Croatia. And also being a deeply sceptical person, or a practicing Catholic, a deeply sceptical person on political matters, um, I wanted to know why this uh, demonic character called Stepinac was so hated by the Serbs, uh, and why uh, he was so much part and parcel of this um, wave of propaganda which was used in order to justify an unjustifiable war. And that is really how I came to be interested in this subject. Um, and so I concluded after a certain time and after I had spent seven years learning Croatian, again a rather strange thing for an Englishman to do but we do strange things, um, I decided that I was going to write his life. And uh, he'd already been uh, beatified by St. John Paul II in 1998 at Maria Bistrica. Um, and I'd started on the book uh, when uh, I learned that um, Cardinal D'Amato, prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, uh, in 2014 had announced that um, uh, Stepinac would be canonized, canonized, uh, towards the end of 2015. So I thought, well, this is pleasing, pleasing for me, pleasing for the church, pleasing for Croatia, and pleasing for the sales of my book. But so it was not to be, because um, at this juncture, the uh, Serbian Orthodox Patriarch, uh, Irene, wrote to Pope Francis to protest, and I think to Irene's great surprise, was actually taken notice of because they'd been writing such letters for many years and nobody had taken notice of them in the past. Uh, Irene said that uh, Stepinac was a war criminal uh, and that there was absolutely no way in which such a man should ever be canonized. And so the Pope put it on hold. I should say that when he put it on hold, it had gone through the whole process because in uh, 1998, uh, St. John Paul II uh, in his uh, decree of uh, beatification had made it clear that uh, Stepinac had died uh, in odium fidei, that is that he was a martyr, he had given his life, uh, he had not actually spilled his blood, though we come to that, but he, the circumstances of his death were the result of hatred of the faith which he witnessed. And if you are a martyr, just in case any of you are hoping for um, canonization, um, if you are martyred you only need one miracle, and so only one miracle was required in order to gain canonization, because the other investigation had been done, of course, for the beatification. And so, in fact, really, one could say that here is, you know, here is Pope Francis's entree, and somewhere buried in there is all he has to do is to sign. But anyway, he didn't sign, and what he did instead was he actually he called for a mixed commission, that is, of Orthodox and uh, Catholic clerics. Uh, though it was a Vatican Commission, to investigate the um, accusations of the Serbian Orthodox Church. This is, was unprecedented. And um, I know exactly what was said, and all the learned papers were produced, or at least learned on one side and just papers on the other. But anyway, lots of papers were produced, uh, and um, I helped translate these, so I can really speak with some authority on the matter. And I can say that uh, the, uh, every one of these uh, accusations, which, is, which were really quite silly, I mean, they'd been generated by the communists in the 1940s and then just recycled by the Serbian Orthodox Church since, uh, these were shown to be completely historically without foundation, utterly without foundation. Uh, and indeed, in the course of the discussion, rather more embarrassing was the degree of uh, collaboration by the Serbian Orthodox Church, by the German, German authorities, and particularly in the mass destruction of Jews uh, in Saimishte camp. But anyway, those papers have, for reasons that we can all speculate on, never been published. Uh, and and the, uh, the canonization is on hold. And perhaps this is an example of ecumenism in action, or perhaps it's something else. 
Now, anyway, let me turn to Sp uh, Stepinac's spiritual significance, which is not my main topic, I should say. I um, mean, the man, in my view, is a saint. I mean, I'd be wasting my time praying to him every day if I thought it wasn't. I'm no doubt that he's a saint, but I'm just going to touch on these matters. Why is he a saint? Well, he is a saint, of course, because uh, he practiced the virtues uh, to an historic degree in an historic manner. Um, and uh, his charity, one could describe as vigorous and lifelong. For example, um, provision of the, 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 the caritas, provisions of soup kitchens and so on uh, for the uh, really starving population uh, at the end of the uh, 20s and 30s in, uh, in Zagreb. Um, and also his work for the Jews. Uh, in 1938, there was a mass expulsion of Jews from uh, Czechoslovakia uh, and Austria. And these Jews, many of them, arrived um, in, uh, at the uh, Zagreb station. Mr. Peanuts was there meeting these people off the train with the Jewish community. Um, and his devotion to Mary, well, that matters to us as Catholics. Um, he was the main promoter of what is now the great uh, national shrine of Croatia, Maria Bistrica, which he visited uh, on this very long pilgrimage that they make, uh, but every year, 1935 to 1945, until it was stopped by the communists. But I think perhaps most important and most dramatic, really, uh, and we've heard about the, the horrors that Vincenti went through, which were worse, incidentally, than the horrors that, that Stepinac went through, but one of the main things that struck me when I was reading the diaries of the parish priest uh, in Krasic, uh, which was uh, Stepinac's um, uh, home parish where he was interned, uh, in these diaries, uh, you will find constantly that Stepinac is telling uh, everyone around him that they must forgive their persecutors, they must pray for their persecutors, pray for those who persecute them. And there is a record in there that when Stalin died, what do you think? I mean, most of us might have cheered, but Stepinac said the Hail Mary for his soul. Stepinac's character, well, uh, he was a, a man of his times. And um, what were those times? Those were times actually when uh, prelates of the church were extremely well educated in Central Europe, very well based. Um, and uh, he had a thorough education at the Ungarico. Um, he was well educated, he was well read. He was not an intellectual. If you read his sermons, you will find that they are uh, uh, sound, solid, thorough, slightly boring, but always uh, absolutely to the point. Um, well, that may be as people were expected to be at that time, princes of the church, clerics, senior, senior clerics, but he was a very unusual uh, Archbishop of Zagreb in other ways. First of all, he came from peasant stock, he wasn't one of the gentlemen archbishops. And these gentlemen archbishops were the people who were ordinarily running the archbishop, the archbishopric of the diocese. He came from sturdy, peasant, very respectable, hardworking stock. He was physically and mentally tough. And he was mentally tougher because he'd fought in the First World War. This is quite unusual, you see, for these sort of people. He'd fought on the front line, the Isonzo front, the Forgotten front. Uh, he'd, uh, as his uh, uh, memoirs describe, I mean, he'd seen people blown to smithereens, the blood all over the place, around him. And he was then, uh, he then became a prisoner of war. Uh, he was tough, he was young when he was appointed. He was, so he was 34 when he was made a bishop. He was made bishop, uh, archbishop's coadjutor with right of succession, as it's called. He was only 34 at the time and he had to get a special dispensation because uh, that is too young officially to be made a bishop. And this youth manifested itself in radicalism and energy. And radicalism and energy, and I'm quoting here my friend, the late Professor Ivo Barnatz, a great Croatian historian, American Croatian. He once said to me, he said, I think Stepinac was scary. And I think Stepinac was quite scary at this time because he was really vigorous. And he didn't, uh, he, was, he, was not un, he was not unkind, but he did not tolerate nonsense. And uh, so for example, um, I think his relations with the canons, 
the, 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 the very well provided for canons of the archdiocese uh, of uh, Zagreb. They live in a place called Kaptol, and it's a beautiful place, and you should go and see it. And they've got what are called their curie, which are basically palaces. You know, it's not a bad, not too bad a life, I should say. And um, anyway, in the 1930s, these people were, they really didn't think it was a very good idea to spend the resources of the church on lots of new parishes in working class areas. There was a lot of resist resistance. Well, he wouldn't tolerate that. And in fact, there were five parishes when Stepinac took over, um, and Zagreb had expanded massively in between the wars, become an industrial city. Only five parishes and some monasteries looking after these. But, but he created 14 more, 14 more. So in fact, if you walk around Zagreb now, almost certainly you go to some relatively new church, you'll find, oh, that was founded by Stepinac. And uh, I, I'm quite amused at the fact that in the 1950s, when Stepinac was interned in Krasic, um, still, um, the, then the, the, the communists were putting a lot of pressure on the church, and one of the pressure was that they were going to take away these curie, the property from these canons. And the canons said to Stepinac, it is your duty to maintain the historic property of the church, in other words, our curie. And Stepinac said, no, it's our, it's our role to play witness whatever the cost to our lives or anything else. An unwelcome message, but a pretty good one. So um, Stepinac was not a political figure. He didn't like politics, but he was drawn into politics, of course, because those were the events of the time. He tried to stop his priests becoming in politic, uh, political. That didn't work very well either, particularly under the Ustasha. But he tried. But if we want to understand Stepinac's political outlook, his political doctrine, if you like, you have to look at the two great political encyclicals of Pope Pius XI. Uh, both of which came out in March 1937, without which we can understand nothing of this wartime period. The first was uh, Mit Brennen der Zorga, which is the uh, condemnation of um, uh, national socialism. And the other is Divini Redemptoris, which is the condemnation of atheistic Bolshevism. So those were the two enemies that Stepinac recognized and against which he fought and Pius XII fought. We must always remember that. Well, Stepinac had to live through three uh, thoroughly unpleasant regimes, um, and I'll deal with each of them in turn. The thing is, with unpleasant regimes, we always think that nothing could be worse than this, and in Croatia it usually was. So the first of these unpleasant regimes was the first Yugoslavia, monarchical Yugoslavia, under the Karadjordjevic dynasty, which was uh, basically a greater Serbian Yugoslavia. Uh, and uh, it is, I think, yet another little interesting paradox and uh, how the, the, the enemies of the church, are so, so often the mistakes of the enemies of the church work to the church's benefit, was that King Alexander didn't, because at this time uh, the, uh, the king in, uh, had uh, a veto on the appointment of all bishops, even by the Pope. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was an inherited concordat from Austro-Hungarian times. Uh, and the, um, there was a, a back and forth, back and forth. Who was to succeed uh, Archbishop Barr as he got older uh, as Archbishop of Zagreb? And in the end, they put forward, Barr put forward this name of Stepinac, who was his, just, he was his master of ceremonies, a very young man. And somebody said, oh, no, they'll never accept that. Ah, somebody said, they will. Because, in fact, Stepinac, at the end of the war, had become what is called a Salonica volunteer. That is to say that he fought on what is called the Salonica front right at the end of the war. And um, the, reason why he, the reason he did this, quite clearly, is to get out of an Italian prisoner of war camp and to get back home, not because he was a Yugoslav enthusiast, but luckily, the king was persuaded that this really meant that this Stepinac, he's basically one of us, he's a pretty Yugoslav orientated guy. So he is the man. So actually, that was how Stepinac was appointed. Well, in fact, at this early period, it's worth remembering that the church in Croatia, church in the, the Catholic Church, was very pro Yugoslavia, uh, very pro Yugoslavia. And uh, um, the, this enthusiasm, uh, which was naive, I think, but it was, it was real. And it, it was only stopped by two things. First of all, the murder, the assassination of the Croat leaders uh, in the uh, Belgrade parliament in 1928, 
by a Serb nationalist who had been put up to it by the royal court. And the second event was the refusal of the Belgrade Parliament to ratify the 1937 Concordat, which had been agreed after much negotiation between the Pope and the Yugoslav government. And the Concordat was not ratified because the Serbian Orthodox Church threatened with excommunication uh, uh, the members of the uh, Skupština uh, who, who were prepared to ratify it, so it was withdrawn. Now, after that, one can say that, in other words, from 1937 on, there was no enthusiasm among Catholics for the First Yugoslavia. And that's the background to the uh, almost unanimous welcome, which uh, Stepinac also uh, was very enthusiastic about the uh, creation of the uh, uh, independent state of Croatia, the Nezavisna Država Hrvatska, the NDH, as we call it, in April 1941. Now, of course, this happened uh, because, uh, because the Germans had defeated Yugoslavia and they moved in, they attacked, they moved in on 6th of April and the NDH was uh, proclaimed on the 10th of April. And Stepina sent out a Te Deum welcoming this state. And he never um, apologized, he never regretted doing so. Because his view was, and he said this on the, uh, in, in court, he said that the Croats had as much right to their own state as any other nation in Europe. Simple as that. And so he never apologized for that, but nor did he believe that simply because you had your own state, it meant that the, that the, the group, in this case the fascist Ustasha uh, uh, movement, who'd only come, about 200 of them incidentally had come over from Italy. I mean, there were very few of them, but they were quite um, capable of bringing terrorism really to, to, the, to the top of the state. But anyway, they were quite a small group. Uh, he was opposed to these people uh, from the beginning. And within three weeks, he wrote to Pavlich complaining about the killing of 260 Serbs, uh, 260 Serb civilians in Glina. Well, um, I'm running ahead of myself a little. But I think the important thing is to understand that uh, those like Stepinac who welcomed the independent state of Croatia, have its, Croatia having its own state, it did not mean that they welcomed the actions of those who were running the state. Far from it. Now, what were, what were this? And it's necessary to say it so that you understand this, because there's no reason, as you say, why well, you should understand it otherwise. That uh, the Ustasha authorities, um, embarked upon a policy of killing Serbs. This was because they hated Serbs and they had uh, a nationalistic um, uh, desire for revenge against them because they thought the Serbs had, been, uh, had the upper hand against them for too long. So that was an Ustasha policy. The killing of gypsies was, uh, which was also um, nearly all gypsies were wiped out, um, this was mainly, this is a policy which was conceived by Nazis but carried out enthusiastically by the Ustasha. But the policy of liquidating Jews was not a homegrown Ustasha policy at all. It was a policy which was imposed by the Nazis. And this, of course, means that, that since Stepinac wanted to save as many people as he could, his actions in dealing with these matters were obviously going to be different in different cases. Now, the Catholic Church had had, had had difficult relations with some Jews in the past. And that had been because the Jews were associated, the urban Jews, with uh, liberalism, Freemasonry, certain anti-clericalism, and also because the church also objected to the fact that Jewish doctors were prepared to perform abortions, which generally Catholic doctors would be too frightened to do. Perhaps by sincerity, anyway, they wouldn't do. So there was a tension there. But the Catholic Church in Croatia, like the Catholic Church elsewhere, was never and has never been anti-Semitic. This is not true of the Serbian Orthodox Church. I do not wish to go into all the details, but I can tell you that it is factually not the case of the Serbian Orthodox Church. It is not the true generally of Orthodox churches who have a different view of the role of Jews, even in, as far as the uh, theological role of Jews in the uh, understanding of the passion. 
But anyway, the Serbian Orthodox Church did not oppose the killing of the Jews, and almost all the Serb Jews were killed as well. In fact, Serbia was declared Judenfrei, free of all Jews, one year before Croatia. Stepinac himself had very good relations with the Jews, and this is really important, I think, because it meant that he was not prepared to fit into some kind of category of just, oh, you're only there for Catholics. Of course, he was principally there for Catholics. But as I say, he'd met them at the station in 1938. And incidentally, he got them papers to get out of the country in 1938. Uh, and then when the persecution started, which he did very early, um, he gave, and we know this, he was prepared privately to baptize Jews who came to see him, which gave them some, some hope of actually not being deported and killed. Um, and by stubbornly refusing uh, to be quiet, and also by embarrassing the Ustasha leaders, many of whom were married to Jews. Uh, uh, Pavlovich's wife, Mara, was half Jewish. Uh, uh, Slavko Kwatenik, number two, his wife was Jewish. Her name was Olga Frank, she committed suicide. There were lots, and so in fact, you see, he was able to use, he was really very unpleasant to these Ustasha people, and through this pressure, he saved the Jews who are married to Christians. But of course he couldn't save that many. So he intervened time and time again, and he intervened particularly in cooperation with the uh, Zagreb chief rabbi, uh, Miroslav Shalom Freiberger. Uh, and he intervened for the Jewish children to try and get them out of the country. Uh, when the Jewish uh, old people's home was going to be closed by the SS and the uh, inhabitants deported to Auschwitz, uh, Stepinac moved them all to his uh, summer residence. And there they stayed with other children, Serb children and so on, who had been saved and were visited daily by the Archbishop. Uh, in May 1943, the order came, uh, Himmler came in in May 1943, he came to see uh, uh, Pavlic and said that they were not dealing with the Jews in a sufficiently efficient manner. And so then all of the rest of the Jews were rounded up. And uh, the chief rabbi, uh, Freiberger, uh, uh, obviously learned of this, and Stepinat offered Freiberger and his family uh, a safe haven in the archbishop's palace. He offered them, I don't know what would have happened, but anyway, that's what he offered them. And Freiberger, having thought about it, refused and went, decided to go with his uh, flock to Auschwitz, where he died. <coughs> Uh, and uh, I think it's a little final uh, uh, proof of confidence in the Catholic Church that the Jewish community in Zagreb entrusted its library to the archdiocese. The archdiocese looked after its library and handed everything back intact after the war. And uh, Esther Gitman, who's the historian of Jewish res rescue in the Endecha, um, and is a Holocaust survivor, she says in her book, this one sentence, during my travels throughout the countries of the former Yugoslavia, Israel, and the United States, the name most frequently mentioned in my 72 testimonies is that of Archbishop Stepinac. Well, I mentioned the Serbs. The Serbs, the Serbs were killed in large quantities by these uh, mainly Ustasha uh, bands. But the background to the Serb persecution was this. And again, we must just understand this. Sorry, it's complicated, but let's get this right so that you all know what the answers are. The Catholic Church did not, did not go along with, or was in no way complicit with the persecution of the Serbs of, uh, in Croatia. There were some uh, renegade Catholic priests who did this, but it was against the orders of their bishops and particularly against the orders of uh, Stepinac. Uh, and the basis of it was that uh, a deal was done between uh, Hitler and um, uh, Pavlovich that uh, there would be a mass deportation of Slovenes to Serbia and Serbs to uh, Ser Croatian Serbs to, Ser to Serbia. And this was used as uh, an opportunity by the Ustasha for mass killings. Uh, and in this period, there was also uh, the 
for a brief period, the state decided that it would um, send out uh, missionaries, as it was called, to try to get Serbs who were Orthodox to become Catholic. Now, this was a state initiative. Uh, it was uh, attacked publicly by the uh, Croatian bishops. And also, it wasn't wanted by them. It wasn't wanted by Pius XII. Well, I'm afraid I'm not able to go on much more. But anyway, um, uh, I I'll then I'll just say that uh, there are 200 pages of names of people that were saved by stipulants. Uh, and I will just end then by saying what he uh, uh, did when he was after the show trial in 1946. Um, that he was interned in, uh, first of all, he was uh, imprisoned in Lepoglava and then probably poisoned. Uh, and then he was um, interned in Krasic. And from there, he sent out um, letters encouraging the uh, uh, bishops and priests to stand firm against the communist authorities. And in particular, he told them to stand firm against the, sorry, John. Sorry. Well, I, I'm, yeah. Uh, sorry, I was meaning, yes, because of. Yeah, yeah, well, I am trying to do it. No, no, I'm <laughs> I am trying to do it with uh, new diplomatic relations with the Vatican, and then 1970 basically opening up uh, completely that the church that the, that the Communist Party had to deal with was the Pinatzis church. It had not been subverted at all. It was actually a church which was completely loyal to Rome. It was, had not been do doctrinally undermined, and it was the church that we see today, which indeed is a church that has been through an heroic time uh, and is through Stepinac's life, um, a witness to what it is to be a Catholic in difficult circumstances. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, John. Good to see you, Robin. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Mr. Ambassador, uh, welcome to the second panel. Uh, my full name is Alvino Mario Fantini, and despite its Italian origins, I'm a Vermonter and a Republican, lifelong, probably one of the rarest breeds in the United States, other than perhaps a Republican in San Francisco. Uh, as we've all just heard, <clears throat> uh, we've, we've learned quite a bit about the exemplary and heroic lives of Cardinals Mitsenti, Wyszynski, Stipinac, and Pope John Paul II, St. Pope John Paul II. And we've learned about their struggles against the threat of atheist totalitarianism. And we might be tempted to say, phew, all that stuff's behind us. Those days are long gone. Uh, in fact, actually, fortuitously, this morning, I received this book just before I boarded the train to come here from Vienna. It's titled Godless Utopia, Soviet Anti-Religious Propaganda. And this little book reprints dozens of the most outrageous examples of anti-religious messaging of the Cold War. It's, it's a sobering trip down memory lane. 
But what's apparent to me is that this kind of crude, anti-religious fervor has not entirely disappeared with the demise of the Soviet threat. In fact, in many ways, the challenges we face today are more dire, the threat being more insidious. These are challenges, I hasten to add, posed not only by the aggressive secularism and atheism that surrounds us in our general culture, they are also legal and administrative threats that not only seek to the removal of religious symbols from the public square and classrooms, et cetera, but which increasingly seek to invade our consciences and make sure we conform to the new orthodoxy. Enough from me. Our next two speakers shall speak to us about some of these challenges and outline what, if anything, can be done to counter these threats, especially in places like Europe, but also around the world, of course. Our first speaker is the U.S. Ambassador to Hungary, David Kornstein. Uh, I'll say very briefly, I'll truncate with your permission your background, which is most impressive. In fact, when I read it, one term came to mind, noblesse oblige. Most young people don't even know what that means anymore. I think his background, the ambassador's background, exemplifies what that meant or what that should mean. Not only is he a well-respected business leader and worked across various sectors and industries, but his life has been a a life, uh, his life has been a commitment to civic engagement, working for associations, volunteerism of all sorts. I'm sure you can read it on the bio sheet that's in your package. Uh, he was appointed ambassador in May of 2018 and confirmed happily by the U.S. Senate shortly thereafter. Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to invite you up. Please take the floor. Vino Mario Fantini. That's, that sounds so much better than David Kornstein. Uh, it's good to be back here at uh, the Danube Institute. Uh, good to see my friend John O'Sullivan. He does such great work over here. The only thing better than John, I think, is Maureen, uh, his lovely wife. And uh, we have two ambassadors here, my friends from Croatia, and the dean of, of the diplomatic corps, the nuncio from the Vatican, by way of the United States as well. So um, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, it's a little bittersweet for me because, uh, I don't know if you know or not, but uh, two weeks from this Friday, <clears throat> I'll be on an American Airlines plane back to New York, and I will have ended my term as ambassador to Hungary. Um, it has been an uh, incredible experience for me. I had been told by several other ambassadors that no matter what you've done in your life, and uh, I've had a, a fairly full life, that this will be the most incredible, exciting, thrilling thing that you'll ever do. And it's 100% true. Um, and a lot of that has been made so because of the, the people in this audience, the Hungarian people. I really have fallen in love with this country. and. Uh, <laughs> and uh, will return, not as an ambassador, but I intend very much to continue along with this relationship. Um, I, I had been uh, told to speak about uh, freedom of religion and how the State Department or the American laws are affected by that. <clears throat> I have a, a wonderful public affairs department at the embassy and they wrote this very nice speech. Uh, number one, I hate reading a speech, so I, I won't read it. 
and uh, I felt it was a bit boring also. I don't think I have to tell you how America feels toward the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, the freedom of press. It's ingrained in our DNA. We've had so many people that have died defending those, those freedoms that uh, are enriched so much into, into our being. So um, I thought maybe I, I would just mention a couple of two people uh, who have affected my life while I've been here in Hungary and how it's influenced me in my beliefs in religion. Uh, you might find that a little more, more interesting, I think. So I have a, a, a very, very lovely office at the embassy. But I'll tell you, I would never, ever want to live in that embassy, in, in that office, for 15 years. And that's what Cardinal Massenti did. His bed, his office was, or desk was in my office. And every morning when I walk into to work there, I see a little plaque over the fireplace. It has his name on it. And then there's a picture in the office of the Cardinal. And I must tell you, it's been truly, truly inspirational. Because I, 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 anyone that comes into that office, I, I look at almost through his eyes as much as my eyes, and how would he have reacted to what the issue is that came into the office. And it's worked, it's really worked very, very well for me. Another man that I should have known more about and really didn't know enough about uh, was Raoul Wallenberg. Now, this is a man, as you know, a diplomat that came here and saved tens of thousands of Jewish lives in 1944. And I truly, truly often wonder, and I, I don't know why, why in life I was so fortunate, why I was so lucky to be born in 1938, as I was, in New York City, to a mother and father, two wonderful, wonderful Jewish parents that brought me up really in a fine fashion, got me to the right schools, and sent me off, off in life. And I asked myself, what if I would have been born to two wonderful parents, but born in Budapest in 1938. Now I've had, oh, at least 100 people that have come to visit me that are friends or business people here in Budapest. And whoever comes here, I take down to the Danube and I show them that elegant, simple memorial of the shoes where a lot of young, young people were tied together and to save bullets, one person was shot and then the rest were thrown in the Danube, the icy waters of the Danube, to drown. What if I were in one of those pairs of shoes? Why, why, why was I so fortunate and lucky to have had the other life instead of the life that I had. And religion to me is something that's very, very important. It's not important just to me, it's important to the American people. And the defense of having people go to the church or synagogue or mosque of their choice is something that that every year or two, a new law is passed in Congress and signed by whoever is president defending those rights, the rights of worshiping wherever you wish to worship. So I, I thank the two men that affected me in that way, the cardinal and the diplomat, 
And I thank the Hungarian people for making this experience the greatest experience in my life. Thanks for having me here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Our uh, next speaker, a final speaker for the evening, is Professor Rocco Buttiglione. I'm happy to see you here. We encounter each other every now and then at different academic and philosophical events across Europe. My understanding is he is now teaching at the Edith Stein Institute in Granada, Spain. A nice position. Granada is beautiful. But I should explain that I, I've known of Rocco since I was in high school. That's true. Um, and I became aware of his activities at the International Academy of Philosophy in the Principality of Liechtenstein, where I was going to be a doctoral student until they closed it down, sadly. So I've been left with this regret of not being your student. But perhaps through our casual conversations, you could teach me something. Uh, he, he doesn't need much by way of an introduction. He was trained as a lawyer, but is a philosopher and taught philosophy and ecclesiastical philosophy, you could say, for years. He became vice rector of that institute in Liechtenstein. He went on to teach at other places around Europe and even, I believe, in Central or South America. He has been a member of various pontifical councils. He's currently the member of the Pontifical Academy of Social Science. And he often graces us in Vienna by teaching a summer course at the International Theological Institute. Professor, I, uh, there's not much more I can say uh, other than to recommend to the audience to read his hundreds of articles on theology and philosophy. Professor Buttiglione, please, you have the floor. I suppose that the speaker have the privilege of taking out the mask. <laughs> um, well, uh, I remember when I was a student, now and then, the professor uh, wanted me to answer questions. And it happened, now and then, that I was not prepared. Then I lifted up my hand and said, unprepared. Now I find myself in a similar situation because I was not told that here we had such a high level scientific symposium. I was told we would, would have only a podium discussion uh, and a round table. And I have no papers. Papers are important. They give the impression that you have prepared yourself and that uh, you are a serious person. Especially in the German speaking world, I must add. Here we are not in the German speaking world, but uh, there is a long story of relations between the German-speaking world and Hungary. So I am compelled to improvise. I don't know whether this will be uh, an advantage or a disadvantage. Uh, I must add, as an introduction, uh, uh, that uh, uh, I am an Italian. Uh, you know that Italians are too talkative. And uh, in addition to that, uh, I have been for a long time for 24 years, a large part of my life, a politician, and politicians can talk hours and hours without saying anything. And uh, the worst of all, I am a professor, and professors are, as we all know, unbearable. Um, so, Alvino, when I'm going too, too far, please stop me. Just give me three minutes to make my conclusions. Um, I have been asked to speak about uh, the situation of believers, Christians and believers, in, uh, in, in Europe that is uh, secularizing itself, or perhaps uh, there is not much left to be secularized. It seems to be thoroughly secularized. What should we do? It is not an easy question. Uh, I have two answers. The question is not easy, but you know, uh, the, the gifts of uh, Italians and politicians and philosophers. I have not only one, but two, uh, two answers. Um, one answer is the answer of Pope Francis. 
the second answer is my own answer. Uh, since the uh, answer of Pope Francis is more central, more original, goes more to the root of the question, I begin with Pope Francis, and I, and I then will expose my personal considerations. In um, uh, the uh, document uh, uh, Evangelii Gaudium, the Pope invite, tells us, you, we are not in uh, an epoch of changes. We are changing epoch. We are moving from one epoch to another epoch. And many things that we considered as established in the future will be questioned. Many things that now seem to be firm in the future will get moving. Uh, be prepared for an epoch of change. And uh, in an epoch of change, uh, the first suggestions that Evangelii Gaudium gives us is uh, do not defend the spaces that you are occupying. Try to start processes. What does it mean to start processes? Uh, let us go back uh, to, for a moment to what we have heard on, uh, on uh, Wojtyla and on Wyszynski. Um, they started processes. They did not try so much to defend the rights of the church as uh, they had inherited them. To start processes means that uh, the young Wojtyla uh, becomes a friend of a group of students. And he goes there where the students are. He does not wait for them to come to the church. He uh, becomes a friend of them and participates in their interests and takes as a starting point, uh, not the doctrine, not the books, but the human experience of uh, the young people. He goes canoeing with them. Uh, he becomes their confidant and they talk to him but they fall in love, and he tells them to explain what it means to fall in love, what is the right way of falling in love. And people become more and more interested to him, because those who follow his uh, suggestions that are drawn from uh, Christian moral, Christian and Catholic <coughs> morals, well, they are more in love with one another, and they create better families, and these families last in time. And then other people want to follow the same path. I remember once he told me that he had accompanied to marriage 203 couples, and none of them had divorced. Can you imagine 203 couples? None of them had divorced. Um, this is to start the process. Um, don't wait for the young people to come to you. Go to the young people. Don't be afraid of speaking their language. If you don't know their language, learn their language and try to understand what are the things that are really important to them, the interests that move their life. Uh, and that is the starting point. Um, we can say this with the words of the Ecumenical Council Vatican II or the theologian, the theologian. Um, Karl Rahner, invites to enter into the transcendental horizon of our time, the things that people think to be evident in our time. Uh, and this is the first step. Many theologians and, excuse me, eccellenza, also many priests, uh, remain in the first step. The methodology of Wojtyla implied the first step go to them, enter in, within their transcendental horizon. But there was a second step. You must bring them out of their transcendental horizon, towards war, towards war, towards truth, towards the truth of man that God has revealed in Jesus Christ. So not a doctrine that has to be imposed. But first you must help them to understand the questions they have. And the doctrine must be presented as the answer to their questions. And this is possible only if you stay with them, only if you love them, only if you convince them that you love them. Then they will follow you. This is the process in which the phenomenon called authority uh, is uh, 
founded. I follow somebody who loves me and who is one step ahead than me on the path leading to truth. By the way, I think that theologians would say uh, that this is the witness of the evangelists and of the church. A credible witness is a witness who knows what he is saying, knows something more than you, uh, and whom you can trust because he loves you. That is the beginning. That was the beginning of the church. And that was also the beginning of the renewal of the Polish church. Now, you, uh, in, in our memory of all of us, are the millions of people who were greeting Wojtyla when he arrived to, uh, to Warsaw. Uh, some of you perhaps remember the, the older ones, those like me. No, one million people in uh, uh, Platz Zwycięstwo in, uh, in Warsaw. But those million people were there because thousands of priests like Wojtyla, perhaps not so faint like Wojtyla, but uh, trying to uh, work on the path of sanctity like Wojtyla, uh, had uh, been together with millions and millions of young people. And they had won a battle for the heart of the new generation. Start processes. Don't defend spaces. Well, no. I, I, I take the liberty of correcting the Pope. Uh, sometimes you have also to defend spaces. But if you just defend spaces, in the end, uh, you will collapse. You will be won. You can win only if uh, you uh, can win the hearts of the people, if you can start processes. And um, uh, which kind of processes? I think the first process that we have to start um, is uh, uh, to help people. Well, it's actually what Wojtyla did. He made pastoral for the family, not for the family that exists, for the family that does not exist uh, yet. The most uh, important uh, fortune in life is to find a good wife or a good husband for, for, for the women. And the strongest uh, impulse of young people is, of course, sex. What shall I do with it? What is the meaning of it? How can it live it so that it gives me all the wealth that is contained as a potentiality in, uh, in the fact that I am a man or I am a woman? Um, help young people to, uh, get, uh, to, to fall in love, first of all, and then to get married. Everybody tells the young people, don't get married. It is not worth the while. Love is an illusion. Sex is a reality. Love is an illusion. And, and the old young people feel in their heart that, yes, no, they, they, they want love, not just sex. But they are discouraged. And at the first difficulties, they abandon. Now, we must help young people to believe in love. And it is, a, to a large extent, a responsibility of the older generation. Not my generation, your generation that is the generation of my daughters. My generation is the generation of the grandfathers. Uh, and so, yes, our, our witness is also important. Our testimony is important. But more important is the testimony of those who are, who are of their parents and of their friends who are a little bit older than them. That was, that is, I think, the first task that we have as church. Go where they are, enter into their mentality, and then help them to grow out of their mentality. How? Through the word of God. There is a beautiful expression of a great uh, um, Swiss theologian. I have been his friend, insofar as a young man can be a, a friend of a man who is much wiser and much older. Uh, he is uh, uh, Ansurt von Balthasar. Um, uh, I remember it in German. Gottes Wort sprengt Grenzen. Gottes Wort schafft Zukunft. The word of God breaks uh, the, the borders, breaks the limits. The word of God creates future. So the first field of the battle that is uh, in course now in Europe, I think, is uh, the family. Not in a static sense, also in a static friend, uh, sense. Um, the walls of Buddha have helped the major nation to resist in difficult times. But uh, they were not enough. 
uh, in the end, you won and you became a nation because you went out of the walls and accepted the, the clash in the open fields with the Mongols, with the, the Turks, with, with the Germans sometimes, uh, with, with all different kind of invaders of your country. That is to start processes. To defend the walls is to defend spaces. Sometimes it, is, it helps in a certain moment. It is already time? Cinque. Cinque All, oh my goodness. I thought I was just only at the beginning. Then, um, uh, then, uh, then I, I skip all what I wanted to say, and I go to the conclusion. <laughs> um, you can imagine other priorities. Um, Wojtyła left us a, an idea, a, a small philosophy and theology of culture. Take the speech at the UNESCO. Um, yes, Marxism is right. Uh, man uh, depends on the method of production, on the way in which he produces and reproduces his material life. So all the respect for uh, material culture. But the work man is capable of, the creativity man invests in his, in his work, uh, the capacity of working together with others instead of killing each other, depends on the heart of man. Work, every work begins in the heart of man. And in the heart of man is the self-consciousness, the idea I have of myself. Am I, uh, and the idea that I have of myself depends on the relation that I have to the absolute. Religion is the basis of culture. So we have to renew this basis of culture through religion. And uh, this creates communal personalities. A communal personality is a personality that creates community in the family, with friends, and in the church, and so forth. In the nation, the nation is not an object. That is the nation, no. The nation uh, is not a subject. The nation is a dimension of our interiority, a dimension of our subjectivity. If you create communal personalities, if you create families, families in touch with others create nations. We must be able to speak to the heart of nations, and we must be able to speak to the heart of Europe because these nations are not independent of one another. Yes, they are independent of one another in one sense, but in another sense, they are not. They depend on one another in the same sense in which I depend on my wife. I cannot say what I am if not in relation with her. I cannot say what I want if I don't know what she wants. I don't always do what my wife, wife wants, but I cannot know what I want until I know what she wants. And it is in the relation with her that I am myself. Um, uh, we have had uh, in the field of European politics great successes with John Paul II. Communism collapsed, um, uh, Germany was reunited, Europe, uh, well, no, um, uh, you reconstructed a, a functioning democracy and also functioning, uh, a functioning market economy. But in the end we were defeated. We were defeated because we wanted the Christian values in the Constitution and we did not get them. We were defeated because we wanted a constitution. A bad constitution is better than no constitution. And we did not have a constitution. We had only the treaties of Lisbon. And as a consequence, we had 15 years in which Europe was the Europe of rights. What is wrong with rights? Well, what is wrong with rights is that you must have also duties. Because through duties, you give rights to others. Through duties, you allow uh, the family to have rights. We have spoken all in the name of the rights of the individual. We have forgotten the rights of families. We have forgotten the rights of nations. And the result is a European Union in which everybody, uh, there is a verse of uh, T.S. Eliot. Uh, he says, uh, if they ask you, why are you in the Union? What, what, would, what would be your answer? Only to make money one out of the other? And if you are there only for that reason, when a crisis arrives, you will begin, become the enemy of your brother. Everyone will try uh, to sort out, to find his own way. We need solidarity, the alliance of free market and solidarity that John Paul II wanted. Um, we have lost that path because we were defeated. They did not want our Europe, but they had not a project of Europe. And the result was, and the Europe of bureaucracies, and, uh, and the, the temptation. Then I work out. 
of, uh, as our British friends. I don't think that that is the right way. I think we should start again with the original intention of Europe, um, the intention that was of John Paul II, culturally and politically of Helmut Kohl. We have been defeated, but now I think a new generation became aware of the fact that on the basis of moral relativism, you will not build up anything good for the European people. And, uh, well, I am an old man, uh, and uh, do you know what is the difference between old men and young men? Young men, uh, a little bit like uh, the intellectuals of today, uh, have the, uh, the idea that history will continue always along the same path. Today we have secularization, tomorrow we will have more secularization. In the end, Christianity will disappear. Older people, uh, well, I had this idea uh, when I was uh, uh, the age of some of you. And, um, and then I have seen that God has put his finger in history. And history has changed. In 1977, everybody was convinced in Italy that Marxism was the future of mankind. And then, uh, then God puts his finger in history arrives Wojtyla and, and after Wojtyla Solidarność and, 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 and the world changed. So I am sure that the world will change again because um, a society made only of individuals without community and Europe without Jesus Christ cannot survive for long. And then the people will become aware. Uh, Father, you, you know, uh, this is the history of uh, the Ancient Testament. The people of God in times of prosperity, they take their way, they abandon the law. And then comes the time in which they have lost the law and they have lost the bodies of their unity and they are oppressed by their enemies. And then they go back to God. And God sends again a prophet. I don't know if I shall see uh, the prophet, the next prophet, that uh, will change uh, the face of the earth. But I have 12 grandchildren. I am sure they will see they will see him. But in order for them to see him, we must uh, preserve the faith today. Stepinac, uh, Wyszynski, uh, um, Mizenti, they did not know when God would have put again his finger in history. And they died without knowing that. No, Wyszynski, no, Wyszynski <laughs> saw the beginning of the new age. But uh, many people preserved the faith, knowing that someday the liberation of God would have come. I think we must preserve the faith. Thank you. Excuse me for having been too long. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. John, I believe we have five more minutes, so it, it, could I do something just to wrap up this panel? I, I don't think I could forgive myself if I didn't do this. I want to throw out one question to both of you. Um, President Trump, a while ago, signed an executive order for religious freedom. Uh, USAID has an advisor now on religious freedom, uh, Mrs. Norquist. Uh, on September 30th, there was a symposium in the Vatican with the U.S. Embassy there and Vatican officials on religious freedom and related issues. So I'd like to ask both of you, and I think this is for benefit of the audience uh, and given the title of this particular panel, what is the future of religious freedom given all these initiatives? Are you both positive and optimistic for the future or are you more like me, I've been called Dr. Doom by some, more pessimistic that this is more kyakkira, more, more blah, 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 and that nothing will, will come of it. What, and if nothing will come of it, what is necessary beyond these uh, executive orders and these symposia? Please, uh, Ambassador, first yes, you. Yes. <clears throat> oh, that's uh, a very, very good, can you hear me? Very good question. Um, I think when you, when you look at the world today, uh, you have three powers that are really dominating the world. You have the United States, you have Russia, and you have China. Um, you obviously have Europe as well, and Europe is, uh, in my mind, their hearts and minds are still with the West, especially with NATO and in defense agreements. But when you look at the freedoms that we have in the United States, 
and as I said before, that are so dear to us, that isn't going to falter in any way. The other two areas are two different stories. Uh, I don't have to tell anyone in Hungary uh, what it is to live under communism. You had your own, your own experience with that. It wasn't a very pleasant one, as I understand. So I don't think you want to go back to that. I don't think the world wants to go back to that. You see what the Chinese are doing, persecuting Christians and Muslims. I don't think you want to be part of that group either. So uh, it's, it's the choice of the country and the people in the country of, of where they want to go with their future. I certainly believe there's hope. Uh, I know I, I always relate everything back to just my own stories and my own family. Uh, I have a very small family. I only have, you have 12 grandchildren. I have one twelfth of that. I have one grandson. Uh, he's the love of my life, as he's yours, the yeah. <laughs> as, your, as, as all of your grandchildren are the love of your life, I'm sure. Uh, he's being brought up as religion is a very important part of his life. His mother and father see to that. To me, everything evolves from the family. And I think the families of, of Europe, the families of, of the Americas, uh, believe that this is the right way to go. But you have to lead by example, and it's got to be part of your life. And if it is, uh, I don't see I don't see religion leaving. One, I don't want me to go on too long, but I had three years ago, a little less than three years ago, I had a quadruple bypass. I had never been in a hospital in my life, and uh, all of a sudden I had a quadruple bypass. Seven hour operation, very, very complex, but it's like today having your teeth cleaned. It's really a very, very routine example, as long as it's not in your body and it's in someone else's body. So uh, I'm very close with my rabbi in New York. His name's Arthur Schneier. If we had a pope, he would be the pope. Uh, when the pope came to New York, he came to our synagogue. He's a, he's a, he's a fascinating, fascinating man. And I was nervous. Before the operation, I had uh, a, an ablation, which is a procedure, an angiogram. It, it, it was a terrible process. And you get a little nervous when they tell you what's going to happen. And the rabbi said to me, I want you to say a prayer. I'm on the board of my synagogue. I can't sp speak a word of Hebrew. I, I'm not the best example. Of, of which a person should be on the board. But the man, the rabbi said to me, I want you to say this prayer. And it's four words in Hebrew. Adonai li veloi ira. Those are the only four words I know in Hebrew. And the translation of that is, God is with me, I have no fear. I walked into that operating room, I didn't have a fear in the world. It affected me so, this prayer, and I say it every night before I go to bed and after I say goodnight to my grandson. <laughs> but I say that every night, and I have no fear. I'm 82 years old, I have no damn fear at all, nothing. So faith can be very, very rewarding. It has been for me, and I have a little more hope, perhaps, than, than you do, Alvino. Uh, I, I do have faith that, that, uh, that, that we've been tested before. It's like in America, we're getting tested with a lot of things right now. Religion's been tested many, many times. I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's going to stay. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. That was lovely. Thank you. Professor. I completely agree. The future belongs to those who have children. 
those who have no children will disappear from the face of the earth. And uh, uh, the culture that is opposed to Christianity today in the West is not a culture that encourages people to have children. And so they are bound to do, disappear from the face of the earth. Under one condition, that we can educate our children. And uh, this is the task of the families. And here, uh, I have some reserves on the way in which uh, we often talk about um, religious freedom. Because um, there is an attempt to present as religion freedom an arbitrary uh, capacity of uh, everybody, even very young, to decide on religion uh, on their own. You cannot decide before you know. For uh, the first part of your life, you must listen to the proposal of your family uh, and make an attempt to see whether it works in your life or not. Otherwise, without any proposal, abandon to yourself, you do not grow, grow up as a strong, as a tough human being. You become a weakling who is carried from any, uh, any wind of the moment. Um, did you see the story of that uh, um, English girl who's now, she is quarreling with the British state mm -hmm. because when she was 16, she asked to change her sex. And they did it, insofar as it is possible. They did it. And now she complains, you should not have listened to me. You cannot pretend that a girl of 16 knows uh, enough to make a decision uh, this level. So we should also stress the rights of families, not just only the rights of the individual, because the family is the individual. It's one fundamental dimension of the individual. The person is individual and community. Very often in this uh, international discourse, they speak only of the individual, and this is the great heresy of today. Thank you. Uh, a round of applause for these two fine gentlemen. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for allowing me to moderate. Uh, John, some final words from you? Well, uh, first of all, uh, first of all, may I thank uh, particularly Ambassador Kornstein and Dr. Bussiliano for uh, a really uh, profoundly um, I I moving and interesting uh, set of final reflections. I'd like to thank all of the other speakers. I'd like to, um, t um, I'd like to just perhaps have one reflection at the end. Um, I'm riffing off what uh, Dr. Buttiglione said um, about solidarity and uh, attempting to to um, move into uh, other people's imagination and lives and work with them. You know, we at the the Danube Institute, we always say we believe in three sets of political ideas. We say what they are, and then we say, but. We believe, in addition to that, in debate. Debate between people who share our views and those who have different views. Now, debate begins in division, in a way, and sometimes promotes it. And it, sometimes, therefore, if you're sitting around a table, shouting and shouting and disputing and disputing, if you go on shouting long enough, something happens. You get thirsty. <laughs> at, 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 at that point, you get some drinks, and the conversation develops in a different kind of direction. It becomes more personal, it becomes more hopeful, it becomes more creative, and it becomes more collegial. It becomes an expression of solidarity. So it's with great pleasure that having thanked everybody for, who spoke, my colleague, my colleague Robin, all of you who are here, to say that if you go down to the Carolee restaurant, down the stairs and turn right, there are drinks and there, are, there is food. And if you would like to continue the conversation, we would be delighted to join you there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. I hope so. <laughs>